we greatly appreciate it. Before we begin this presentation, we will have a short video on our association. It provides a comprehensive picture of the association. Just sit back, relax, and watch this. Dr. Xavier, the video, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Xavier, for that uh, lovely PowerPoint presentation. Now we begin the webinar. Let's begin with an introduction to the speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Shobhana. Shobha. She is a brilliant academician who is working as an assistant professor at, the, at Anna University in Chennai. 
She has a PhD in English and master's in education for which she has been awarded a gold medal. She is a teacher researcher, a teacher educator, and her special, special area of interest is problems associated with shifting pedagogical patterns in emerging field of ELT. To comment on her presentation, we have Professor Iram Gambhir. Professor Iram Gambhir heads the Department of English at Manipur University. Though uh, he has his heart in language teaching, he has designed and offered a large number of in-service teacher training programs. And he has closely studied the ELT situation as it exists in Southeast Asia. He is often invited to these countries as a resource person, as a consultant, and he at present heads the Eltai chapter in Manipur and proposes to have an international conference very soon. Um, over to you, Shobha. Un thank unmute you, your mic. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. A very good evening to all the participants participants of this webinar. I first of all thank Eltai for opening up this platform for us and for all the webinars they've been giving to the uh, members and also to the huge audience of English teachers in India and abroad. So the topic of today, I think that is also the need of the hour. In times of COVID, we are moving towards gearing up our vocabulary at a different level. We are talking about empathy, we are talking about trust and several issues. But within the realm of ELT, let us try and look what vocabulary means to us and how we can develop our vocabulary with reference to the academia. Let me share my screen. I hope my screen is visible to all. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I've always been, you know, felt very fascinated about Gatti's uh, words which says, the limits of my language are the limits of my universe. How true. The way we define ourselves, the words we use to think about ourselves, to explain ourselves to people, are the words that exactly also help us to understand the universe around us. That's exactly why I have used this particular quotation to begin my presentation. Moving on. Before understanding vocabulary itself, I would like to draw your attention to the passive vocabulary and the active vocabulary that we have. So what is passive vocabulary? Most of us understand many words. Passive vocabulary therefore refers to the words that we understand, but cannot use when we are either speaking or writing. So these are certain words that we can identify the meaning of whenever we read newspapers or when we read research articles. But it is very difficult for us to use these words when we are speaking or writing. And now when you look at active vocabulary, these are words that you can use when you are speaking and writing. Of course, by now you would have understood that our passive vocabulary is huge and it definitely outnumbers our active vocabulary. Sometimes we search for words, we keep looking for the right word till we arrive at the word. So it can be very embarrassing sometimes for either students or for teachers. And there are also several strategies by which we can bring our passive vocabulary into active vocabulary. By trying and finding the right words that are necessary for our own field. Now, as a teacher, there are some words that are absolutely essential for our profession, whether it comes to classroom transaction or networking. Now, these are some of the words that might be in our passive vocabulary, but it is absolutely essential to bring it to our active vocabulary. By constant practice and by a conscious use of these words, we can improve our vocabulary usage. Most of the times, this is exactly what my students tell me. They tell me, ma'am, I can't understand these words. 
I don't read the newspaper because after 10 sentences, one word comes as a speed breaker and I don't want to proceed. They say they sound all Greek and Latin. You know what I usually tell them? I tell them you are right because they are all from Greek and Latin. So in the history of English language, we very well know that there are so many words from other languages that have entered the, la the language of English. So we have words from Greek, Latin, French. Of course, we also have many Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, and other words which are now household common words in English. So let us try and see how we can overcome this particular hurdle. So what are some of the strategies that we can try and explore if English sounds all Greek and Latin to you. So the strategy that I propose for today, I have named it Operation Etymology. Sure, it sounds like a war at a, a term, but then this is exactly one of the strategies that you can use so that you can overcome uh, trying to build your vocabulary and not still be scared about that it is sounding all Greek and Latin to you. So what is this operation etymology? Etymology refers to trying and analyzing the root of the word. What I have done in this particular slide is, I have tried and done a, an etymological study of the word vocabulary itself. Now vocabulary is a word that comes from vocabularium, a Greek word, which again comes from vocabulum, which is rooted in vox and which comes from a Celtic word, which the pronunciation is a little tricky. It is vec. Now, if you look at the meanings, which I have given on the right side, vocabulary definitely refers to a list of words. Vocabularium also meant to a huge compendium of words, whereas vocabulum refers just to words. And if you look at vox, it actually refers to the voice. And then vec, it refers to speak. So now if you look at the vocabulary or the etymology of the word itself, it will help us a great deal to understand how we can expand our knowledge. And also by doing this kind of an etymological overview of words, we will be able to remember the meanings of the words also. Now, how does the etymology method work? What I have tried in this slide is, I am trying to analyze some words using their etymology. Let us go into the slide. First of all, let us look at the word philosophy. Now, all of us know that the word contains of two roots here. One can be used as an affix also, phil, which refers to love or affinity, right? And the other word actually comes from the Greek goddess of wisdom, Sophia. So somebody who loves the Greek goddess of wisdom or somebody who is in search of wisdom is supposed to be pursuing philosophy. And then now that you know the meaning of the word phil, you have the word philanthropist. Of course, you know that anthropos refers to human beings and a philanthropist is somebody who loves the service of human beings. Of course, you can think of some names like Mother Teresa. You can think about Bill Gates, the foundation that he's run. They are all philanthropists. What uh, happens Shoba, when you... you yes, Shoba, you have one more minute. Yeah. So what happens to this word misanthropist? Now, mis refers to hate, which is the opposite of phil. And so you can find out that a misanthropist hates human beings. And a misogynist also refers to somebody who hates women. So genist comes from gynecium and other related terms. I have some examples for you. So the examples include... Now, most of us know that graphy refers to write. So here are different roots of, uh, you know, different words which come from the word graphy, from the root graphy. So most of these words, you would have already, uh, you know, you would have come through these words, you would have read these words. Now, this is another interesting example. So man, it refers to hand, as in manipulate or manual. You have manufacture, which is made by hand, manage, lead by hand. 
and so you can see how these are all words that refers to something that is handmade and emancipation a very interesting word a setting free of hands so the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between a lightning and a lightning bug so you will have to choose whether you want to use the lightning or a lightning bug when you are using the words and you have to make the right choice thank you that will be the end of my presentation thank you thank you shobha that was brilliant uh, may i now invite uh, dr professor gambhir to give his comments on shobha's presentation professor gambhir uh, professor gambhir uh Uh, your comments on Shobha's talk, Professor Gambhir's connection is lost. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Okay, uh, sir. Um, uh, I just got a call from Professor Gambhir. His connection is lost. Okay. Uh, would you Would you like to take it uh, Take it up, Doctor Sanjay? Okay. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Shoba, for this very crisp, brief presentation on etymology. Uh, you talked about active and passive vocabulary. So uh, you were talking about bringing words from passive vocabulary to active vocabulary. So what I could gather from your presentation was that you were probably talking about the dominant vocabulary. and the active vocabulary there are words which are lying dormant because they not been used uh for quite some time and uh, they may be uh field specific words so as in when uh the reader or the user comes across those words uh they understand those words and then try to use them or try to comprehend the text through that vocabulary so this is what i could gather from your presentation and you were also talking about the um words how students face problems in finding the meaning of words especially those words which come from other languages like greek latin japanese chinese or maybe certain other languages because english is an amalgamation of so many other languages so this operational etymology that you were talking about uh you just briefly talked about it and i would like uh, you to uh, you to just talk a little further about what this operation etymology is and how is it different from etymology in general okay thank you for your comments and for the question operation uh, etymology uh, shobha shobha will yes, take sir. the questions later okay yeah, we'll definitely. take the questions later and uh, dr sanjay would you like her to respond now or later uh, i think this is part it, of the it, comment uh, okay. it's okay it's okay uh, uh, so if, if that's the anything more to add uh, professor sanjay yeah uh, that is all that i could gather and i think we can move on to the next presenter thank please uh, thank, you. Sure. thank you now we have the second presenter for the day our second presenter is uh, mrs punita gadia she teaches at baps school in gandhinagar gujarat she is basically a scientist and she has a lot of experience of research in pharmaceutical field however she took to teaching as a divine vocation and hence she joined the profession under the patronage of his holiness the pramukh swami with teaching as a passion she has earned several credits by attending courses conducted by relo and the british council in her talk today she will focus largely on some of the strategies that she has used in her classroom uh, practice uh, over to you dr punita thank you sir uh, okay uh, dr punita thank you sir can you hear me yeah yeah please Okay thank you everyone for joining us I'll be talking about my experiences in the classroom when it comes to vocabulary teaching um so imagine this vocabulary I've lived in Wales for quite a bit and um this is their vocabulary imagine having to teach this is so difficult so the Welsh fun fact double l in Welsh is pronounced as clan so thank god we have english so going back to english now 
Now, as um, language is constantly evolving, so is our vocabulary as well. So vocabulary is directly related to fluency, comprehension, and student achievement. So this is constantly evolving. When I was doing some research, when I started teaching vocabulary, I uh, came across uh, this, that vocabulary is um, split into three tiers. So you have the tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one focuses on basic words that are commonly used, like book, dog, cat, etc. Then you have the tier two, which is the high frequency words, which is what we are focusing on uh, for students. And then the tier three, which is very subject related. So for example, if I'm studying medicine, then I would be focusing on tier three. Now, during my research, I also came across uh, Robert Marzano. He's an award-winning educational researcher and author based in US. Um, he did some research on uh, building up vocabulary and has written a book on it. So if anybody's interested, it's available to buy online. Um, he's uh, described this process, he split this process into six steps. And uh, we might already be doing this in our classroom, but not particularly in the order that uh, uh, he's, uh, he's set out here. So the first step, he says, the teacher has to provide a description or, or the example of the uh, term. Uh, second step, he says, is the linguistic definition. So students have to give the description or an example in their own words. Then we have the non-linguistic definition where the students use visual aids. So that either they draw a picture or they act out the term. The fourth, the teacher then comes in and refines the understanding by engaging students in different activities. And then fifth, we have the collaborative work done by students. And sixth, we then, a uh, teacher then comes in and engages students in uh, different vocabulary uh, related activities. Like I said, we already might be doing this. We're just probably not aware of it, that uh, it should be set out stepwise. Now, some of the practices when I started teaching, some of the things that I was doing, um, students were not really, you know, um, responding. And then I did some more research and I came across this book called Vocabulary Strategies That Work. So do this and not that. So I'll just, on the right hand side, all the things that I was doing wrong and how I then turned it around into things that actually worked in the classroom. So. The first one is assigning long lists of words. We all do this, you know, we just give up 15, 20 words to the students and say, okay, you know, here you go, take, take the dictionary and simply just copy out um, the definitions. And at that point, students were ready to throw their books at me. So what I did instead was just select the words that I want them to know. So if we refer back to our tiers, we focus on the high frequency words that be useful for them. So tier two words. So if selecting those words and then instead of just Copying the um, definitions from the dictionary, of course, the dictionary is relevant for reference, but just having the students to come up with their own examples as well. So because it becomes personal, the students are more likely to remember it as well. And then providing a bit of visual cues, so either giving them the pictures or uh, having them to um, act the term out. There are so many activities that can be uh, done with this. The other thing is the lack of uh, word wall in a classroom. Now, I don't mean that just taking at random words and sticking them up on, 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 the board, on the wall. What I really mean is having a very structured uh, word wall. So this is one of the activity that I did uh, with my classes. I just gave them a few words and I said, just go and find out all the words related to them. They did that and they came back, they made a poster and stuck it, uh, stuck it in the wall, on the wall. So that was good for them because it was personal. They'd done the research, they had it, you know, it was, uh, so they're more likely to remember it. The other thing when I uh, moved to India, what I noticed was students in primary, when they come up to secondary, they were still using the basic primary language, so they had not actually got that uh, enough vocabulary. So as teachers, we should model the use of the language and set some standards for them so they, they could follow those standards. Um, other thing I also noticed in my classroom uh, or uh, with other primary teachers were giving out tests like, um, here the, there is a word and then you match it to the definition. Now, I'm not saying that is a wrong thing to do, uh, absolutely good for memorization. But instead of doing that, what I tried to do was um, got students to actually use the words in their writing and speaking, which also uh, helped them to remember the words. Um, now, I'd like to talk about some of the tools that I, I use in my classroom, which have been very effective so far. And one of them uh, is a semantic map. It's just like a mind map. And you give the words and the student will then, students have to brainstorm and come up with uh, words related to the uh, 
the word given. Uh, it's very useful because there are so many activities you can do in relation with brainstorming, you can do collaborative work, etc. It will, the students seem to enjoy doing that as well. Now, there is also a possibility of doing this online on a website called MindMap. It's, um, you can do this asynchronously or you can do it synchronously as well. It's very helpful for students. And then we have the classic flashcards. Um, now, what I like to do instead of just, rather than just giving a blank flashcard, I like I like to customize my flashcards. So I have lots of uh, stuff that students can fill out, and you know, uh, drawings, and they can have which part of speech it belongs to. An interesting interesting fact about the word, for example. Again, this can be done online as well on the website. You can see on the screen vocabulary.com or you can make your own, customize your own quiz, vocabulary quiz. There are a couple of websites that I've given, quizzes, Quizlet, Kahoot. You can play this uh, synchronously online or you can just uh, create a link and students can play, play it on, in their own time. I have here another uh, list of uh, activities that I've tried in my classroom. They've worked very well. Um, you can um, Google these and you get all the information. Um, there are lot, lots of information and templates available on Google for these activities. Um, just because I placed an X under primary doesn't mean that it cannot be played. Uh, it just means that you have to adapt the game a little bit to primary standards. Okay, so those are the strategies that I use in my classroom. I'd like to know what you use in your classroom and what works for you. So please share that on your chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Punita, uh, for keeping up the time. Uh, that was excellent, uh, a very good strategies. To comment on her uh, talk, we have an equally eminent scholar, Dr. Shibani Dubey. She's an associate professor of English at the Bhopal School of uh, Social Sciences. She has 20 years of teaching experience um, and she holds a doctorate degree in English, and she has worked on the place of Girish Karnad. Though her research is in the literary studies, she is a keen practitioner of language teaching, and she has presented papers both at national and international level. Over to you, Shibani, for your comments. Thank you so much, Mohan Raj, sir. Uh, Ms. Punita, thank you so much. It had been quite evident from your presentation that you have had ample experience of implementation of pragmatic strategies for vocabulary building. I must congratulate you for this wonderful, crisp and candid presentation. Thank we you. all understand that vocabulary is central to English language teaching because without sufficient vocabulary, students cannot understand others or express their own ideas. Talking about the importance of vocabulary, the famous linguist David Wilkins argued that without grammar, little can be conveyed, but without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. Indeed, people need to use words in order to express themselves in any language. Lewis further went to argue that lexis is the core or heart of language. Voltaire purportedly said, Language is very difficult to put into words. I believe English language students generally would conquer that learning vocabulary also helps students master English for their purposes. At this level comes the need of contextualizing the vocabulary building strategies. I feel that the learner and the trainer share a unique bond wherein the trainer has to understand the indigenous setup in order to implement a pragmatic strategy for enhancing word power of the learners. The trainer has to keep in mind the local context, situations and circumstances in mind to design a methodology for building vocabulary. The learners need to empathize with the words. That is, the words need to bring out very explicitly the denotative and connotative meanings to them so that they acclimatize to that particular word. Ma'am also spoke of tiered vocabulary. Here we need to agree that all speakers have both an active and passive vocabulary. Yes, typically a speaker's passive vocabulary is much bigger than their active one. 
And here comes the intervention of activity-based modules, which provide the learners a strong pedestal to convert passive vocabulary into active one. We as learners will have to design modules based on Bloom's taxonomy, which eventually gives a pragmatic bench to knowledge sharing, followed by understanding, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. As Punita Ma'am said, that as per the six steps of Robert Marzano, the learning should culminate into a successful student activity, which is a kind of evaluation of the entire learning process. To conclude, I'll just add that vocabulary building has to adopt an interesting strategy. Otherwise, it would become boring, monotonous, and would remain passive till the end without culminating into any practical utility. Just with a quote of T.S. Eliot, he says, a vocabulary of truth and simplicity will be of service throughout our lives. Thank you, Punita Ma'am, and thank you, Mohan Raj, sir. Thank you, Shubani. Thank you for those lovely comments. Now we have uh, Dr. Niha Nizara Hazarika making her presentation. Uh, she works as an associate professor of English in Sonpur College, Assam. She obtained her doctoral degree from the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, Shillong campus. Now it is called English and Foreign Languages University. She has been teaching at, at the undergraduate uh, level for almost three decades now. Uh, besides teaching, she is involved in developing curriculum as well as course materials for higher secondary students. She is also a teacher educator and she has conducted workshops both for secondary and uh, tertiary level teachers. Today, she is going to talk about a few more strategies of teaching vocabulary. Over to you, Nizara. Yes, sir. I'd like to share my screen. Could you increase the volume, please? Volume yes. of yours. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, right. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, today, I'll be speaking on uh, the effective ways of teaching vocabulary in a low resources, low resource classroom. Uh, the, my presentation is based on my experiences as as a teacher, as a teacher trainer, uh, who is teaching, uh, you know, uh, in a low resource classroom. Uh, so I'll be uh, speaking on uh, various aspects of uh, vocabulary and what are the strategies we can take up in a low resource classroom. Uh, as we know, most of our class present, uh, most of our classes are low resource classroom uh, hmm. oh yes um, uh, where is that oh yeah sure okay um can you see it um it's not coming up yep uh, yes it's fine yeah no Okay, now you can see, I guess, yes. Um, so uh, when it comes to vocabulary, uh, we know, sorry. Vocabulary uh, acquisition, we know in the in the, in a classroom situation, it's very crucial to second language acquisition. Um, even though we say it's like we've got passive vocabularies and active vocabularies, but then when it comes to acquisition, it is not a passive uh, act. Rather, it is a very, very active, uh, which requires active participation uh, from the side of both the learner as well as the teacher. And to use a word, the students, they need multiple exposures to a word before they can actually use it. And, uh, you know, like as Stephen Stad had said that, you know, we need to, uh, you know, give multiple exposure to the students. That multiple exposures, not naturally, it means that we use the word, uh, you know, in a repetitive or, you know, repetitive manner. But we have to provide different uh, and multiple context, you know, to use it. Um, so, uh, like uh, I was about to say about the different tiers of uh, vocabulary but already Punita has already spoken about it, uh, you know, in a tier two, like when we talk about vocabulary acquisition, we generally, we meet, uh, you know, we, we mint uh, about this second tier vocabulary. These words are the words that needed to understand and express complex ideas in the academic context. When we need to learn a particular word, uh, so when we talk about vac vocabulary acquisition, mostly we uh, talk about the second tier um, of vocabulary. And when it comes to teaching vocabulary, uh, explicit uh, instructions of you know uh, vocabulary is very, very 
uh, required because we need to have clear cut of, you know, strategy to teach our students how to acquire those vocabulary. And to develop vocabulary intentionally, students should explicitly be taught both with specific word and word learning strategies. Those strategies we must keep in our mind when we teach our students uh, vocabulary. Uh, so the teacher to teach unfamiliar words, um, you know, like the first day, what they have to do is that, you know, it's uh, we are teaching vocabulary in terms of our textbooks or text. But before going to the text, you know, we have to, mar you know, make the students aware of the unfamiliar words. And then these words should be, uh, you know, Told, would this would be uh, defined and discussed and it gives the students some idea about what exactly they are going to do and the teachers they need to use specific strategies to for scaffolding the learners vocabulary learning and uh, here i'll be um, you know talking about the different stages because as i told you uh, it's not exactly a single strategy that i'm talking about but i'll be uh, trying to present kind of a trajectory where we can take our students to understand a word and so uh, you know we have got three uh, stages where we can make our learners understand or make our learners uh, you know and take a word and uh, the sort of first strategy i mean first stage will be uh, you know the teacher the word when the word is detected okay this is the unfamiliar word for our students and so the teacher conveys the pronunciation and the meaning of the new vocabulary and in the presentation stage there can be uh, different techniques like visual uh, technique verbal explanation we can use dictionary word association activities and visual techniques i'll just uh, you know like to take a moment and you know this kind of visual aid we can uh, take because it's a low resource classroom we cannot have a smart classroom i mean smart board or the internet or internet you know the different portals or websites but we can make use of this kind of you know visual aids so that the student can understand a word suppose this is ap apologize uh, the student can understand and then we can use uh, verbal explanations you know we can tell them about the word its usage in the grammatical you know it's it's syntactic uh, in the usage or um, you know it's uh, different kinds of uses that we can make use of the word and then of course we make use of dictionaries that is one thing we normally do in our classes and one more uh, important um, you know technique that we can make use of is uh, word association activities word association we can associate one word with other words and so that the student get kind of an exposure to know how they can actually use different kind of words so um, already punita had said about uh, semantic mapping semantic mapping is uh, it's it's an word association activity and we can make use of lots of uh, you know uh, different kinds of uh, wor wor you know work uh, associate different kinds of words with the central word and from one word we can again go we can go for different kinds of words um so like it's if it's an athlete we can ask them what are who are the athletes like the runner someone who is a, a gymnast or somebody would say a you know football player a horse rider so many other things they could share they could share with their uh, with their prior knowledge so their prior knowledge will be judged you know uh, along with uh, their um, you know to learn the new words so word association is highly effective um, you know in a, in in a classroom where they can give they can give their input as well uh, so in the um, uh, practice and production, I will, the practice is highly warranted. We know the teacher checks what the student has understood properly and engages them in the learning process. And production is the third stage where the student, you know, they will, the teacher will consult and try to get the students to relate the word for their personal, the contextual, uh, in the contextual terms the student can use. And in this particular uh, state, uh, this, uh, the central task for teachers at this stage is to help learners turn input into intake what they have already taken from the day what they, what they have already understood now they have to make use of that so in this particular the teacher should guide the learners comprehend at the and the context in which the word can be used um, in in this grammatical context in its different ways you know they like the, how they can use it in a in a phrase in a sentence so in different ways how does the the particular vocabulary could be used and having shown the meaning of a word the teacher should provide student with enough practice on that word and they need a lot of practice as we know and for this practice and production uh, the activity that uh, you know that can be really helpful is the word will the word will uh, where we can make the student uh, you know we will what we can do is that we can find some words five six words not more than that and we will make the students into different groups and we can give them those words you know they can choose their words and then they will work in uh, different uh, you know activities and then they will discuss among themselves and then they will spin the wheel and they will you know this is the box where they can put that suppose if there is a word 
uh, which part of speech is it? If it is a verb, if it's a noun, and then what is the antonym? What is the synonym? You know, if they can, uh, you know, uh, have a they can rhyme the word and so on. So we have got different, uh, you know, activities that they could do, and at the end they can come and present it. Sometimes it is found that the students they are not aware of such, some of the words. Suppose they don't know the antonym, and what happens? Their peers, the other students, can give them feedback. Okay, this is what it is, and then. There are some very shy learners who can, uh, you know, who can write, who can draw, who can act, you know, and they can, we can tap their intelligences if it is required at this particular stage. So uh, this is all about uh, my presentation. Then we can make the students engage because we know that, you know, until and unless we engage their students, we, we encourage them to learn it themselves. As teachers, we can just be facilitator. We can just be uh, the, the scaffold that they can lean on and then they can develop themselves. So teachers need to focus on the instructions to develop the vocabulary in their learners across various levels in teaching learning env environment. The teaching learning environment is very very important it is different from you know if we teach in a, a resourceful classroom our techniques would be different our strategies would be different and when we are teaching in a low resource classroom our uh, strategies should be different so we have to think in terms of that and as a teacher it is our responsibility how we can deal with such kind of environment and educating students through various activities provide them multiple exposure to the new words and that can help the, them retain the new vocabulary um, teacher uh, teaching strategies must aim at making the students independent autonomous learner that is one thing we need to always remember that whatever we do our end goal should be to make them autonomous to make them independent learner and this student autonomy will come when we give them the uh, you know the opportunity so that they can develop themselves and finally uh, the word there is a great divide between what we know uh, about vocabulary instruction and what we often still do this is by greenwood and that is true to some extent because we know that there are lots of um, vocabulary instruction their strategies are there uh, but then how much do we follow them in the classroom context so we have to as teachers we need to strive the bridge between the, you know we need to strive to bridge the gap between our knowledge and our practice we have to convert it from knowledge to practice that's it thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, Nizara. Uh, that was a very cogent presentation. Congratulations Thank on you, that. Um, Nizara largely focused on teaching learners without much resources. This is something uh, very close to all of us uh, in India. When we talk to our students where they come from ordinary backgrounds and low resources, almost no resources at all. And she, she reiterated some of the strategies that uh, uh, Dr. Punita had said, but some of the teaching aids that she mentioned are really, really interesting. I was particularly attracted to uh, the word wheel, which can be used in a multiple ways. Uh, and it's, uh, it can lend itself very easily, both to group work as well as pair work. I think that was an excellent uh, thing that uh, Nizara demonstrated to us. And the second point that I really uh, liked about Nizara's presentation was the clear cut lesson plan that she provided where three stages of the lesson, presentation, practice and production were given. And she also mentioned what roles the teachers have to play, what roles the learners have to play in uh, each and one of these uh, can uh, presentations. Uh, lend itself very it was, easily it an both excellent to group work uh, as well as fair work. I, I only wish uh, your slides had were a little less crowded. Uh, you look mm -hmm. at your slides with content yes. and also mm -hmm. look at the uh, slides that had uh, the activities. Okay, that was a, there was a lot of okay. difference. I think that's okay. something we learn with practice. I'm sure yes. you will you will do that. Sure. Okay. Now Thanks. now that the presentations are over, I think we invite questions. Uh, Dr. Mithun Khandwala of uh, Ahmedabad chapter. He has collected all the questions. He has organized them. May I now request uh, Dr. Mithun Khandwala to put up the questions on the screen so that we can uh, ask our presenters to respond to these questions. Dr. Mithun. Dr. Mithun. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Oh, we have quite a few questions. We have nine plus three, 12, a dozen questions, but we will take one question each for each of the presenters. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Manju Gurk. Um, this question is addressed to Dr. Shobha. Is there a third type of vocabulary, the ad hoc vocabulary? You mentioned active vocabulary and passive vocabulary. Uh, Dr. Manju Garg wants to know something about ad hoc vocabulary. Would you, would you like to respond, Shobha? Dr. Shobha? Uh, I don't see. Yes, I am here. Uh, yeah, okay. He just unmuted me. That's why. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Manju, for that question. Is there a third type of ad hoc vocabulary? It all uh, depends from the kind of uh, perspective that you are looking at because every day there is so much of research and uh, through these researches, there, there are different kinds of vocabularies that are coming up. Like uh, passive vocabulary is also called as uh, dormant vocabulary. So I think this ad hoc vocabulary is something that you learn on the requirement of the situation. Now, say, for example, when we look at a situation and if a particular group of words are required to work in the particular context, then we learn that vocabulary and use them for that particular context alone. So I think uh, that would be my explanation. Of course, uh, uh, there might be different answers, but as far as I have uh, you know, experienced, you. that would be you know, my answer. You're, you're right, Shobha. For example, yes. today we know the word containment in the in the yes. context of uh, COVID exactly. nineteen. Uh, this word may not be useful to us a little later, so that's mm. some sort of an ad hoc vocabulary. Thank ad you, Shobha. Uh, next question is to Miss Punita, and this is from uh, Miss Biba Devi. Uh, uh, this is a very vague question. Could I move to Dr. Madhumati Kotam Raju's question? Uh, we request for methods or tips to remember new words. This is to Dr. Punita. Activities are done. Uh, request for innovative and quick methods, please. Uh, are there some, that's the idea that uh, Dr. Madhumati, Madhumati has uh, asked for. Uh, Punita, would you like to respond to this? Dr. Punita? Want to right. Uh, you, thank you for the question. Um, one of the tips that I, I, I kind of use, one of the things I use in my classroom is what we usually do is we actually, if we are teaching vocabulary, we take the words and then we move on to something else and then we forget about it. So what when we are introducing a set of words to students, we uh, either by activity or anything, we do the activity, you know, we ask them to write uh, or speak about it. And then after a few weeks, maybe we can revisit it again. So uh, for me, that has worked very well. If I, uh, you know, keep revisiting the words either in their writing or in their speaking somehow. Hopefully that's okay. helpful. Okay. Uh... Now we'll uh, take the last question for the day. Um, we are approaching almost the closing time. This question is addressed to Dr. Nizara. Uh, and the question is from Mohammad Asjad Hussain. Uh, can you please provide establishing comments on low resource context? Would you like to define low resource context, which is a very familiar context. Would you like yes. to elaborate on that? Low resource, yes, sir. sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. But low resource context, um, if you if you visit India, if you go to the nook and corners, uh, if you visit various institutions, we have got the low resource context. We have got the classroom, which are last classrooms where we have got, you know, in my intermediate, in my class two uh, my classes, we have got around 120 to 150 students uh, where the resources are only the teacher and the textbook, you know. And 
and the blackboard that's it uh, we cannot have any other resources and then you have to really really work hard you have to really find out strategies how you can teach your students with that low resources you know when it comes to that um, you know in many of the uh, you know institutions Institutions all over the all over India, you know, uh, this is not the situation here only in the in northeast India or in Assam, but in everywhere, you know. Uh, if you go to the government institutions, we have got such context, you know, where uh, the resources. If you think in terms of within the classroom situation, if you think, and uh, outside also, you know, some of the students you will find they are the first generation English learners. Um, so they won't have any resources at home where they can learn something in the society where they go, you know, there won't be any interaction in English. So, you know, the whole situation is that the context is such that, you know, as teachers, we really have to work very hard uh, to make them understand, to make them develop their four language skills and vocabulary being the sub skill, you know, we have to really, really work hard for, you know, developing that. Uh, for their acquisition of the vocabularies, uh, which will really enhance their other language skills as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nizara. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got instruction that we can take one more round of questions. Happily, uh, this question to Dr. Shobha. Uh, there are three people who have asked the same question, Dr. Rajita Raichuri, Dr. Saraswati Keshuri, and Neela Kandan. The, I'm going to summarize these. We learn a large number of words, but we remember very few. Is there some way that we can really, really remember. See, there is, some, there is a term called uh, surrender value in, in vocabulary teaching, which means of all the words that you remember, only a per certain number of words, they remain with you till for a long time. Why, why does this happen? How does this happen? Shubha, would you like to respond? Unmute your mic. Shubha, your mic is not on. Mute. Think now I'm audible? Yeah. yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Because I think we were all muted. <laughs> okay. What are some methods uh, to remember etymology? Of course, vocabulary retention is a more important concept than vocabulary learning because uh, when it comes to retention, there are several methods. I would always go for reinforcement in various contexts. Reinforcement of vocabulary in various contexts can be very helpful, but this etymology where you identify the root because same roots are available in several other words. So when we go via the etymology root, it becomes very easy for us so that when we identify that root in the word, you know, we, it kind of strikes a chord and it rings a bell and then we come back to the meaning of the word. So reinforcement is something, reinforcement in diverse contexts. That would be my answer to the question because I think uh, that's absolutely one technique that works. I've tried it and, you know, it works. Thank you. Thank you. Um, doc, th 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 there's a... Excellent compliment given to Ms. Punita by Bharti Sadrangani, as well as uh, SQ channel. But SQ channel also has a small question. This is uh, more in the form of a suggestion. Would you like to suggest some websites where they can find activities and uh, exercises for developing vocabulary? Do you have any websites readily at hand? Would you like to mention them? Unmute the mic. Unmute the mic. Hi, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I would suggest if you just go to um, search on Google, you get plenty of ideas and then you can take the idea and then customize it according, according to your classroom needs. Um, but there are plenty of um, Yes, under images, if you click on Google and search images, you'll get plenty of ideas what you can do uh, for word rules. And then just um, do it, you know, ask students to uh, introduce some sort of creativity. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Punita. Um, now, there is a last question to Dr. Nizara. This is from uh, Professor Sanjay Arora. How effective is consulting the dictionary for embedded meaning of a word.
how 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 can you exploit a dictionary for teaching vocabulary developing vocabulary yes uh, definitely um, you know using a dictionary is highly uh, you know it's it's helpful helpful and we have been using dictionary uh, over the years i mean we uh, when we were learners we used to use only dictionary but now so with the coming up with the strategies we need to know lots of other uh, you know techniques how we can actually make use of the word the usage of the word a dictionary would provide us with different aspects like uh, you know like whether it's it's what part of which is the synonym santon is the thesaurus dictionary and thesaurus they really really play a very important role in our understanding of uh, you know of the, of, of the meaning of a word um, but then with the strategies that we've always used we have already discussed i think those will be helpful for proper understanding of the meaning of a word um, the dictionary of course this dictionary will play a very very important role but dictionary shouldn't be the end of you know it shouldn't be the end of all our uh, you know strategies that we can make use of because Uh, as we told you know the embedding of the meaning uh, of a word yes dictionary will play a role um, but then of course we have to need other strategies so that we can use it in multiple context and contextualizing of a word is very very important and in what context we use the word so dictionary of course it is there but then we have got other strategies to follow also and we need to make the learner use the word in different contexts contextualization is that's very very important and there this association of words play a very important role and other strategies that we've already discussed uh, the speakers have already discussed they are also of great um, you know help for the learners thank you i hope dr arora i have uh, uh, i have have re responded to your uh, you know query hopefully i have responded to your query <laughs> thank you thank you Thank you, thank you, Nizar. Um, I think that's uh, that's what we have. As uh, Dr. Shibani rightly quoted, uh, Dr. Wilkins, she quoted Dr. Wilkins said, "If uh, you don't know grammar, you can still communicate something, but if you don't know words, you just can't communicate anything." That's what Dr. Wilkins said long, long ago. Uh, May his uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's a wonderful quotation. With that, we come to a close. and it's my pleasant duty to thank all the speakers the commentators and for the insightful remark they had and teaching vocabulary it's i think we have just begun to discuss it is such a huge field such a vast field i don't think we can cover it all in uh, a session of just about 1 hour i'm sure we can have many more sessions uh, i thank all of you participants have for, for having listened to very carefully and come up with uh, questions that uh, in, uh, really lighted up the discussion and we owe this uh, success of this webinar to the untiring efforts of uh, people like dr shravan and dr xavier pradeep they have provided their technical support dr rajgopalan dr elango dr ramani dr sanjay they have conceived these webinars and it has become a possibility and uh, the amdabad chapter has volunteered to record all this and put the questions everything uh, and facilitate the discussion so our thanks are to all these people before we conclude there are a few reminders that i would like to leave with you uh, please enroll if you are not a member of eltai please enroll yourself as a member of the eltai we have provided the link here and you can use the link to become members second uh, we have also provided a link for uh, providing the feedback giving the feedback use the link to give the feedback please copy it on to your desktop or somewhere otherwise once the meeting is over the link will also disappear please copy it right away so that you can uh, give us your feedback we also would like to say that you will get a certificate for attending these uh, webinars if you attend 6 out of 9 webinars and if you also provide your our, your feedback you are entitled to a certificate the certificates will be dis disbursed from 1st of june but we cannot give all of you the certificates at the same time we are uh, staggering it the distribution is being staggered so you may not get it at the same time so in case your friend gets it and you have not got it please don't get wor worried you will get it all of you will get the certificates but you may not get it at the same time 
once again, thank you all for an excellent participation. Congratulations to all the speakers and commentators, and yes. thanks to the organizing committee. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.